How wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be diving into some recent discoveries and some somewhat unexpected discoveries in regards to some of the most persistent puzzles in astrophysics. The existence of these ridiculously massive black holes in the infant universe in the first billion years following the Big Bang. And that's because for decades our models suggested that black holes needed a lot of time, usually billions of years, to grow into the massive objects we see today. But some of the recent observations, including the observations from the James Webb Space Telescope, have decisively shown that massive black holes, and actually very massive of black holes were already fully formed when the universe was just a few hundred million years old. And so the question is, how exactly did they get so big so fast, and what unexpected physics can we possibly discover by studying these objects? And so some of these recent observations we're going to be discussing today reveal a few surprises in regards to how fast black holes grow, what they eat, but also tell us that sometimes we might actually be measuring the wrong thing. And so let's break down some of these new discoveries from recent papers in the description, all of which, as always, you can find in the description below. And there's actually quite a few papers we're going to be discussing, with quite a few exciting discoveries from just the last few months. As a matter of fact, I decided to divide this into three separate themes. First, their origin, because we have a lot of evidence that some of these objects appeared very early. Then we're going to discuss how fast these objects grow and expected versus observed growth limits. Mostly based on various computer simulations and astrophysical models, compared to actual observations from really far away. And last but not least, we're going to discuss various flares and bizarre measurements, with some of these recent discoveries suggesting that some black holes can actually produce a ridiculous amount of power, several times more than we ever expected. But before we start, let's also discuss some really important concepts. And the first one is known as the Eddington limit, a kind of a cosmic speed limit for black holes. And so when a black hole feeds and starts forming an accretion disk, which then heats up tremendously and produces a lot of radiation, including a lot of really powerful X-rays and a lot of light. From a distance, this object starts appearing much brighter than any star. And this outgoing radiation, because of the astrophysical effects, starts to exert a lot of actual physical pressure. And that's of course the same principle that allows things like, for example, the solar sails, to function in space. But in comparison, our sun produces a very tiny amount of pressure. Here, this radiation exerts so much effect that it actually prevents any more gas from falling in. In other words, it starts to act on the gas with so much strength that it even counteracts gravity. And so in this case, adding to the limit defines the maximum rate at which matter can fall into the black hole before the radiation pressure from its own radiation creates a kind of a balance with gravity. And normally, if a black hole grows slower than this limit, it would require a starting mass of approximately 10,000 suns in order to reach the mass of billion solar masses within approximately 1 billion years, assuming that it feeds for this whole time. But we've seen some black holes that seem to actually defy this limit, suggesting that something else must be happening here, or possibly suggesting that some black holes can somehow bypass this Eddington limit. And that's technically our first discovery. Let's start with discussing this relatively famous object referred to as QSO-1. This is a recent discovery from the James Webb Space Telescope, but here astronomers discovered a new population of relatively low luminosity active galactic nuclei or black holes at extremely high redshifts with relatively similar properties. Today, for the most part, they're known as the little red dots. You can learn about this in one of the videos in the description. But one such little red dot really stands out. QSO-1. It existed 700 million years following the Big Bang at a redshift of 7. And this object shows a lot of unexpected features. For example, some of the recent observations discovered that it seems to have a mass of about 50 million solar masses in the center, with the host galaxy being incredibly small. And so here there seems to be a very large ratio of black hole mass to galactic mass. So basically the black hole is at least twice as big. And this is far outside the standard ratio found in the local universe, except for a very bizarre discovery coming from a nearby object Segway 1 that once again we've discussed in the video in the description. And this potentially implies that we're seeing this black hole during its extremely early formation history. Basically it was just formed and started growing very likely growing the galaxy around itself. But more importantly here, the environment seems to be truly primitive. By using high-resolution spectroscopy, researchers discovered that the gas surrounding QSO-1 has an extremely low metallicity of less than 1% compared to the Sun, basically suggesting that it mostly contains hydrogen and helium, not so much of anything else. And because these elements are normally generated by supernova, it means that this whole object is chemically unevolved 
and very likely only had a few supernova in its past. Actually, possibly just a handful, like one or two. And this is incredibly difficult for standard theories, which usually assume black holes grow steadily inside evolving galaxies. Instead, this evidence supports the idea that black hole formed first, possibly as some kind of a primordial black hole, maybe as a result of some kind of a sudden collapse of a lot of mass, or through some kind of a really massive star collapsing into a really large object, resulting in a massive object almost right away. Either way, it seems to have grown really big, even before the host galaxy had time to chemically enrich itself. And this is completely the opposite of what scientists believed was happening a few years back. And so the existence of this black hole suggests it must have been born really massive. Which leads us back to this idea of super adiantin accretion, basically growing faster than the limit should allow. And here we have a new discovery from a different object, referred to as Rax J0320-35. This is just a little bit closer at a redshift of 6.13, but way more massive at approximately 1 billion solar masses. And so here we actually have X-ray observations from the famous Chandra telescope that reveal that this black hole is growing at a rate of 2.4 times the Eddington limit, or basically 2.5 times faster than should be physically possible. And if this black hole maintained the speed of growth since the beginning, it could have actually just started as a normal collapsing star instead of some kind of an exotic massive seed. And so this growth rate suggests that rapid accretion and super Eddington growth could have actually made some black holes very massive, but through mechanisms we just don't understand, because here it has to somehow deposit more matter than should be physically possible because of that radiation pressure coming from the accretion disk itself. Now, one previous solution for stars involved very powerful magnetic fields, so maybe something very similar is happening here as well. However, some of the most recent cosmological simulations also tell us a slightly different story in regards to this fast growth and in regards to how long it can last. Here researchers modeled black hole growth in a lot of early halos and discovered that some black holes indeed experience this super Eddington growth for just a little bit, but it ends abruptly once the black hole becomes at least 10,000 solar masses in mass. And so at this point, the extreme energy released from the accretion disk pushes away a lot of the cold gas needed for the black hole's fuel and thus slows down the growth dramatically. And so at least according to these simulations, even with the super Eddington growth, the overall increase in mass for a typical black hole should still actually be much lower. In other words, it's kind of difficult to explain why they exist so early and why they're so massive, unless they already started massive. And so the conclusion from this study was that this rapid growth should not actually last that long, and something else must be happening here. But here it's briefly worth tackling one more question. Are we actually measuring the correct things and how accurate are these measurements? Because in most cases the mass of these supermassive black holes is really only estimated using a few things like the so-called broad line region, BLR. The idea behind gas orbiting around something in the center, which then ends up producing a relatively broad line of hydrogen emissions visible in the data. With some of the other methods also correlating this with the overall luminosity of the black hole. In other words, the measurements themselves may not be super accurate. So, for example, what if this gas isn't just orbiting, but is actually doing something else? And this is what's addressed in this study. Here, this investigates a quasar J0529 located at a redshift of 4. And this is also an incredibly luminous object, with initial estimates using conventional scaling, suggesting a mass of about 10 billion solar masses. It would actually make it one of the most massive black holes out there. But by using the cutting-edge Gravity Plus instrument, astronomers were able to spatially resolve the internal kinematics in this squeezer, which allowed a direct dynamic measurement of the black hole's mass using a new method. And the result was astonishing. The black hole was still massive, but not 10 billion solar masses. It was only about 800 million, or approximately 12 times smaller. And the reason for this discrepancy seems to be, once again, gas. Gas surrounding the black hole, but that's not dominated by simple rotation, and instead seems to produce a very bizarre conical outflow. And so here, 83% of all of these line emissions that we assumed were coming from the orbiting gas, instead seems to come from the gas that's being blown away from the black hole at the speed of about 10,000 kilometers per second. And so it just appears to move faster because it's being blown away at us. And these rapid outflows dramatically broaden the spectral lines, resulting in that small mistake when it comes to mass calculations. So here this is not just purely rotational velocity, this is also the result of the gas being blown away. But incredibly, this also means that this black hole is feeding at incredibly fast velocities. Here the overall growth seems to be 6 to maybe even 20 times higher the Eddington limit, 
with this black hole consuming way more mass than it should be able to do. And this is what's producing this massive disk wind and this enormous outflow. And that's not something we've seen before, so this is definitely super exciting. And last but not least, we have what seems to be the most powerful black hole flare we've ever seen coming from anywhere. The most explosive and powerful single event coming from any black hole in history. This was a very bizarre transient event that challenges our understanding of extreme variability. And of all massive black holes we're discussing today, this one was the closest. Redshift of 2.5, or about 20 billion light years away from us. And so back in 2018, this object increased in brightness by a factor of 40. This was recorded as the most powerful AGN flare ever documented. And so since then, for the past 7 years, this event released the energy of approximately 10 to the power of 54 ergs, equivalent to completely converting the mass of our entire sun into electric magnetic radiation. Basically more powerful than any supernova observed, and more powerful than any known explosion. And so the question was, what could possibly cause this? At first it was assumed to be maybe a gravitational lensing or some kind of a visual illusion, or maybe some kind of a powerful supernova, but right now the most plausible explanation seems to be the destruction of a very massive star, a tidal disruption event. Basically a star came too close to a black hole and eventually got dramatically shredded apart. But this is still more energy than we've ever seen from any other similar event, so what exactly happened here? Well, the explanation right now suggests that this was not a common type of a star. It seemed to be an exceptionally large one, possibly at least 30 solar masses in mass, or maybe even more. And finding a star this massive in a destructive environment near a black hole is ridiculously rare. But it does actually support one idea. Theoretical propositions that similar really massive stars may actually be created and exist inside accretion disks, which usually provide a lot of mass for these stars to grow. And so its existence is not impossible. And at the same time, because of all of the energy released here, this provides us with a lot of new benchmarks for the extreme physics that govern black hole environments. And so here the emergent picture from these early black holes is basically entirely defined by some kind of an extreme. Extreme brightness, extreme feeding, extreme stars, extreme flares. And a lot of unexplained chaotic behavior. But because a lot of these discoveries are actually kind of recent, we still don't really know exactly why this is happening. It does obviously change how we view some of these ancient periods and changes our understanding of the growth of black holes. But it does also provide us with some really important hints. First, it looks like massive black holes did indeed exist very early on and possibly formed from some kind of a massive seed very likely as a result of a direct collapse. Otherwise it would be difficult to explain why there are so many of them all over the place. Second, we now also know that some of the earlier assumptions about how we calculate the mass for these black holes may not be always entirely correct. Black holes also seem to produce additional emissions that can actually create certain bias in the observation of the moving gas. And we now also know that sometimes these black holes can result in some ridiculously powerful explosions, more powerful than we ever thought was possible. And so when it comes to trying to understand these giants, we're only beginning to unlock their secrets and only beginning to understand how these cosmic giants became so big over time. But we'll definitely be discovering more of these objects because of new telescopes such as the upcoming Roman Space Telescope or the Rubin Observatory, both of which will be actually able to discover so many more of these exciting giant objects. And so we'll definitely come back and discuss supermassive black holes in some of the future videos. But until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM it directly or by joining the channel membership it grants you early access. You can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.